Paul is in prison. We believe it is in Rome. We believe that he is at a stage where probably will be released and then rearrested by Nero, but we can't say for sure. Clearly, this is close to the end of his life. We've said over the past several months that Paul brought the fight to those around him. And when he was chained to the Praetorian Guard, all of the soldiers and the elite guard, he continued to preach. Every day, chained to a guard, he continued to preach. He had at least an audience of one, compulsory, what do you call that, captive audience? The other guy was the captive audience, and Paul let him know. So I suspect that he did a good ministry in that one-on-one setting. I'm going to believe that because he spent maybe somewhere between two and four years under house arrest, either in Caesarea or in Rome, which meant being chained to a Praetorian guard, that he he mastered, that's the verb I want, he mastered the art of one-on-one evangelism. He said the entire Praetorian guard knew him, which meant that in the rotation of these soldiers, he got to interact with all of them. And because he didn't have any crowds to speak to, he focused on what he was there to do, this one-on-one evangelism. And at some level, I think the passage we're going to focus on today is for that close interaction. It's a familiar passage to many of us, the armor of God. And there are six items in this treatise constituting what Paul called the armor of God. I captured a picture. I'm not even sure it is appropriate, but... Because a picture, they say, tells a thousand words. And rather than read the scripture, you could just stare at that picture. And in my research, I came across a writer who said that because some of the elements of the armor of God are mentioned in the Old Testament, he proposed that the armor of God is not a New Testament idea based on the Roman Empire, but it's actually an Old Testament-oriented idea. I can't find enough support for that, but I did look at the scriptures where these elements are mentioned. For example, if you take a look at Isaiah chapter 59, verses 16 and 17, verse 17 says, For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. In Isaiah 11, verse 5, it says, Righteousness shall be the belt of of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. In Exodus chapter 28, verse 4 says, These are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, that he may minister to me as a priest. Paul never actually encountered military conflict. And the soldiers with whom he was interacting, he was interacting, were not engaged in military conflict. He was in Asia Minor, and there was no major conflict in that area during the time that Paul was around. So even in Rome, when he was in Rome in the imprisonment, there was no major conflict except at the very end. But that was Nero being upset for various reasons, the Christians, etc., the burning of Rome. But Paul may have been deceased by that time. So there was no major conflict. So it's interesting that you would choose to focus on the elements of warfare when you were not actually familiar with actual warfare. I would say that many of us soldiers in the army do not really engage in a lot of warfare, certainly not nowadays, which is unfortunate. Paul was very familiar with Rome taking over Israel. While there wasn't an active war going on, they were certainly there in strength to prevent a war. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like there weren't soldiers around all the time. Right. And Paul was not in that region of the world. He was in Asia. Well, yeah, but... So I'm just saying that, yes, there was something, but there was no active warfare. There certainly was a tension. And uh, when Jesus came in triumphantly, etc., you know, there was this sense of, okay, well, we need to go in there and guard to make sure there's no revolution. Because the Romans were concerned that when you have large crowds coming into Jerusalem and you have these various factions, there was always a possibility that something could break out. So sometimes, you know, you just have crowd control. You have individuals there just in case, but nothing that we know of actually broke out in those days. I don't know of anything that broke out. 
I guess I'm making the point that Paul chooses to focus on what seems like a militaristic concept here, but he's not actually engaged in any military situations and he had not been around them, apart from being continuously chained to a soldier who I don't know if he was dressed in elements of warfare, I suspect not too many because you're not on the battlefield so you don't need a shield and you don't need a helmet. I think it was easy activity for those soldiers to just be guarding Paul. That's my introduction. So we're going to talk about armor. And I don't know how many of us have actually, on a Memorial Day it's appropriate to mention this, been engaged in that kind of military warfare. So if you have, then you have a little more knowledge than I do and you might be able to inform me as to the elements of armor. I'm not going to waste too much time. I'm just going to get into the session. And we'll start reading from the top of the handout. The letter to the Ephesians begins and ends by emphasizing divine power. In chapter 1, Paul prays that the eyes of the hearts of the Ephesians would be enlightened to know and experience God's incomparably great power. Chapter 1, verse 19. As he ends the letter, Paul encourages them to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Chapter 6, verse 10. By putting on the full armor of God. Verse 11. Paul knows that the power of God is the source of our strength. Indeed, it takes something more than our own strength to stand against the schemes of the evil one. Paul's three keys to spiritual victory are, one, to seek God's mighty power in verses 10 through 13. Secondly, to stand firm against evil, verses 14 through 17. And thirdly, never to stop praying. He uses armor as an illustration to point out some things in the Christian life that will keep us spiritually alive. There's no shortage of songs that focus in this militaristic context about needing to be armored for war, certainly in this Salvation Army even though there are fewer of them now than there used to be. And I lamented as I searched last night that some of the songs they would have chosen are no longer mentioned, but I decided not to pick that battle today. Song number 948 says, Be strong in the grace of the Lord. And you'll see how it's tied to this passage. Be armed, armor, be armed with the power of his might. And that's exactly what the verse says. You'll see it in a minute. Be daring, when dangers abound. That means take on the fight. Go to the fight. Be daring when dangers abound. I'm a little bit of a coward in this context. I don't know that I want to rush to the forefront. Because I heard General Cox, yeah, when he was doing the retirement for Commissioners Roberts, talk about that. And the armies that need to ask, what is the point of being an army in a citadel? <laughs> you know, you got to get up there and do what armies do. And I thought, well, it's comfortable in the citadel. That's fine. <laughs> be daring when dangers abound, courageous and brave in the fight. So be strong, be armed, be daring, be courageous, be brave. <coughs> be strong and victory will be your delight. It's a nice fighting song, but I think that we have retreated a little bit from that focus. How we're going to read the scripture passage, which is Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. The first verse begins, finally. It's the end of the letter. Some translations say, in conclusion. I have made the argument to you, and now I'm ready to conclude. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The encouragement Paul gives in verse 10 is, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I was looking at some of the Greek last week, so I thought I would continue in that line. This is actually second person, present, imperative, passive voice. Be strong. The question now is, how is this an actual command? How can you command someone to be strong? So the idea, because it's passive, it means that receive the strength that is available through the means that are available. So if I say, be fed, you don't actually have to prepare the food, you just have to eat the food that is offered to you. Be fed. 
you can choose not to eat. So be strong, he's saying, the strength is being supplied. And he says exactly where the strength is coming from. He says, be strengthened by the mighty power that God is making available to you in the inner man. So I want to ask you the question, what does this mean to you? Personally, what does it mean to you if someone encouraged you to be strengthened in the inner man? By God's mighty power. What are they telling you? I just love the way you broke that down. That be strong and it being in the passive. Because what it says to me, up until this point it always felt like a, like a director. Be strong. But what it's really saying is, the strength is available. Reach out and take advantage of it. And so, again, it says that there is an active participation. We have to participate in uh, accessing that strength. The strength is there. Now you reach out and grab it because the Lord has all the might and all the power. And so I just think what you said is just excellent. Thank you. We think of the fact that Jesus paid it all. And as you go to engage the world... What you tell them as you witness is, be strong. Take advantage of the strength that is being supplied. Be saved. You can't save yourself. Be saved. Avail yourself of what has been presented. Salvation is available. What is your part? Your part is to believe, admit being a sinner, and come into the fold, and then start to grow. So the first parts are basically saying, Lord, I'm not, like the televangelist will tell you, say, I'm sorry for my sins. That's the first part. The penalty has been atoned, has been paid already, and therefore all you need to do is to take advantage, claim this salvation. Likewise, he's saying, be strong. The strength is available. It's not your strength. We focus on this song many times. Christ is all, yes, all in all. The writer says, I have little strength to call my own. But what I have before thy throne, I hear confess is small. But on your strength, O God, I lean, and through the blood that makes me clean. Be strong is not telling you you have to be strong. It's saying the strength is available. The blood is applied, and now you can move forward. Be strong in the mighty power. I mentioned that he does focus on this idea three times. The amazing, incomparable power of God. First in chapter 1, verse 19. He comes back in chapter 3, which we skipped over. Verse 16. And now, as he summarizes, he is reminding that he has said this twice before. One of the songs that I was going to include, but it's no longer the song, but... It's a Doris Randall song. It says, Soldiers of King Jesus fought in days of yore. Mighty was their courage, great the name they bore. Valiantly they suffered, gloriously they died, proud to serve their leader, Christ and crucified. The chorus said, May we never waver strengthened by his might. That the strength is available. And if you put yourself in the stream of that strength, may you not waver because his might is strengthening you. So I think she chose this verse to write her song, Strengthened by His Might. In his steps we follow, in his name we fight. Verse 11, question number 2. Why does Paul offer this particular line of encouragement according to verse 11? Why is he telling them to be strong in the mighty power of the Lord? So that... In other words, he's quickly getting to the point that this is a spiritual warfare. I'm about to tell you about these things you need to put on, but the battle is a spiritual warfare to withstand the schemes of the enemy. The King James says the wiles of the devil. So I looked through a few translations to see what synonyms come up for wiles. And one translation said the ambushings. Another said the tricks. Another the tactics, the deceits, the assaults, the strategies. The evil exploits, the traps. And I think it's appropriate now to have this amplified view of the wiles of the enemy. 
The ambushes, tricks, tactics, deceits, assaults, strategies, evil plots, assailing, straps, because he is never going to quit. He's at it all the time trying to trip you up. And you might feel strong. <laughs> but the only way to cause him to flee, the line of one song says, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. And that is the injunction we have. Get on your knees, and we'll talk about prayer in a moment. If the enemy is going to come to attack you, and you get into that position before the Lord, I think we are told that he will retreat. There are times that you think, okay, someone attacks me, I need to attack them. And Paul is basically saying, in this spiritual warfare, when the attack comes, the surest way to cause the enemy to retreat to get on your knees, to pray. I was going to say, I love the, what you just said about the ambushes and all this, because I just went through a work situation, I won't go into detail right now, where there was schemes, and there was ambush, and there was <coughs> traps, and there was just so many terrible things that were all set. And the song that you referenced, I stand with, my, my strength is, I'm weak, I have no strength. Mm -hmm. and, Based on what I was up against, I literally had no strength to fight this trap and ambush and scheme that was being a set. And so again, going back to verse 10 where it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, that idea, you feel your own weakness. You feel your own lack of strength almost probably first, but the injunction to take advantage of the strength and the power and the might that is available. I just think that it's a good reminder that you might feel your weakness first, but take advantage of the power that is there because the enemy is trying to trap and ambush in different situations. I don't know if you follow what is going on out there. Sometimes it's not worth it to follow, but somewhere in the church world, there are preachers who are saying we only need to focus on the New Testament. So forget that Old Testament stuff. Some of the mega church guys, and it's causing a lot of extra noise by people who are saying, how can they do this? You know, they have their big churches and they're saying that's all we need to focus on. But as you spoke, I thought of the fact that there are many stories, many incidents in Scripture where God told the individuals, you need to get rid of the things you think make you strong. So you can see that I am the source of the strength. So reduce the size of your army to oblige the Lord. You, are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. So that you can see that is His strength. Yeah. I don't know how you do that. I do it with a lot of trepidation. Like, okay, Lord, I don't know that my faith is large enough for me to just let you take care of this. I tell myself that that the Lord fights my battles. But the times that you just want to get out there and do a little fighting on your own because you figure, hey. And what am I going to lose? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When people are coming after you. And it's hard to accept that when people are going to take advantage of you that you should just take it lying down. Almost be a doormat. So you want to stand up for yourself. And Paul is basically telling the Ephesian church in this letter, it's a spiritual battle. Chapter 4, verse 32, two weeks ago, we focused on that. No matter what they do, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, regardless of how they respond, be kind, be compassionate, be forgiving. To be like that. But we say to be like Jesus, this hope possesses me. Well, I think the interesting thing in, in verse 12, it says, spiritual weaknesses in mind says high places or places of authority. Mm -hmm. That almost implies to me, we have a spiritual battle, but we're living in the world, too, where we have people in authority, and they're not necessarily on our side either. So, you know, we're, you know, we're split between spiritual battles and real-world battles that, you know, the devil doesn't have to be involved in. Just, you know, we're making our own issues here, too. So I, I agree with you. Frequently, we recognize that there are some flesh-and-blood battles. Yeah. And for Paul to say, I'm not trying to criticize, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, sometimes you are wrestling against flesh and blood. I mean, that's just the reality. You're wrestling against human beings who are just getting in your way. It could be that the Lord is allowing this person to be a thorn in your flesh, but sometimes I think that it's okay to 
Let them know that what they're doing is taking advantage of you or they're taking advantage of another person. Because you might decide that you want to be compassionate and forgiving and kind to people who are not compassionate and forgiving and kind, who are just taking advantage of you. But if you see them taking advantage of someone else, you almost feel as though you have a duty to intervene and say, look, you can't do that. You can't just run roughshod over other people. Even though you might be willing to take some of that for the sake of the gospel, you figure there are other people who would need you to intervene for them. In as much as you did it to the least of these, you, know, you, you see somebody abusing someone else. You have to take a, a stand. And when it comes towards you, you might decide, you well, okay, Lord, I'm going to... But I personally think when you see someone else in distress, that the Christian thing to do is to respond. It might be to pray, but there are times that we're called on to do something. In the words of William, we'll do something in these circumstances. I made a reference in question number three. Sorry, question number four. How did Paul describe his true enemy in the battle and our true enemy? And that's where verse 12 says, this enemy is rulers and authorities and powers of the dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But he also said to take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26, starting at verse 24. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. And Paul writes to Timothy, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be gentle, able to teach patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. I wanted to focus on the fact that it says that while we might not pick the fight, we need to be able to teach and correct in humility. So the attitude we bring to these situations is what's important. So when someone is doing wrong, you don't just sit there and say, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. The attitude you bring is in humility. You correct them and uh, you might not quarrel with them. Be gentle but if you see a teachable moment, you explain to them why the situation is wrong, why they, what they're doing is wrong, but do not generate strife is what he says. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that these generate strife. So the manner in which you handle these difficult situations is what's important. Don't allow individuals to take advantage and say, Father, forgive them. Well, that's appropriate in some cases, but when you see that there's a teachable moment, that you get in there and you teach and you correct in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. So I think that that's important. That while the battle might be a spiritual battle, there are times that the battle is a real world battle, and we have to ask the question what is our role in these circumstances? At the end of this process, we have to recognize that there are times that you have to take a stand. There are moral and ethical issues and you have to take a stand. You can't just be silent. And this is a big thing now. It, it might be a spiritual warfare. And it's splitting the church. Because we are being asked to compromise on scripture. And the revisionists have decided, well, maybe the Bible didn't mean it that way. Therefore, we were wrong to interpret it that way. And there are cases where we were. We talked about masters and slaves last time. And I said slavery is done with, I hope. So we don't have to confront those set of circumstances again. However, there are many situations, ethically and morally, that we need to take a stand on. And it's important that we take a stand. As opposed to saying, well, we are not of this world, therefore we shouldn't take a stand. There are many situations where Christians need to take a stand. Especially if it is an unpopular stand. But many Christians are afraid to be numbered amongst those who take a difficult position. And I think that the Lord is not going to be pleased with our witness. If when we needed to stand up, we sat down. If when we needed to speak up, we shut up. And I think I don't need to get into a lot of details. I think you have a sense of all the moral and ethical issues that we are fighting in this world now. On the other hand, there are individuals who might say that's above my level of intellect for me to even engage in that and therefore it's best that I be silent. Because sometimes if you listen to a smooth talking person, they can convince you of a particular position but they're beguiling you because they have a smooth tongue. So one should probably take time and come to some of these decisions. Unless scripture speaks to it clearly. And one should probably take time to make sure that one understands the issues. And get good counsel. Get to a conversation with people who you trust and who have a clear way of thinking. 
But even then, some of the issues are still murky. And I have to confess that sometimes it's expedient and comforting to just say, my name is Paul, I'm just between y'all, I'm not getting involved in that. If it went over your head, just leave it where it's at. I asked how might Paul's extant circumstances have informed his admonishings and encouragement. By that I mean, where is Paul as he writes to these individuals? He is in prison. And he has all the courage in the world from prison. He is out there saying, bring it on. Or take the fight to them. Or whatever the case may be, he is being an advocate for the cause. Even though all he can do is witness one-on-one -on -one to the individual he's chained to. He's still getting it done. And he's telling the Ephesians and others, you have more opportunities because you are free. So if I, in my imprisoned state, continue to preach this good news, use me as an example. Imprisoned. He is saying, I am strengthened by the power of his might. Every single day. You are free. You should be strengthened by the power of his might too. But sometimes that gets in our way because too many battles. Paul might have had one battle to fight at a time in the four years of being in prison. Why do you think Paul said that the struggle was not against flesh and blood? We may have tackled that earlier. What else could it be against? Spiritual. Spiritual. So we know that there's the world, the flesh, and the enemy. The enemy is often used in the singular, and this enemy is extremely getting it done because he is bold, thank you. He's very bold. He certainly is finding ways to encourage us to do the wrong thing. And I don't know, he gets a lot of blame for things that he's probably not doing. Sometimes I allow the world to cause me to compromise, and I can't blame him. Have you heard of Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. Yeah. Sometimes you want to blame the devil for things that we have chosen on our own. Mm -hmm. And I think that because we are called to holiness, to walk out this salvation towards entire sanctification, that we can't always blame the devil when we don't do what we ought to do. That shouldn't be an excuse. <laughs> we, right, we look for reasons to say, well, it's not totally my fault. Yeah. But if you're told to walk and you stand then you can't say the enemy is preventing you from walking. If you're told to practice the disciplines, and you decide to be lazy, then it's not the devil's fault. It's not the devil's fault. <laughs> so, Paul is basically saying, get prepared. Put on the armor, because the enemy is going to attack you. And as we talk about the armor in the next few minutes, we'll see that a lot of it is defensive armor. In fact, there's only one weapon of attack among the six things that are going to be mentioned. What benefit does Paul tell us is gained from putting on the full armor? Verse 13. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. So that sounds defensive. Put on the armor so you can stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. Stand appears three times there. Stand firm, therefore. And then he goes on to the armor. So let's go to question number seven. There are six elements of armor. Hopefully the picture tells a thousand words. So I ask, what is the armor? The question is really, what are the purposes for the various elements in the whole armor of God? So let's start with verse 14. There's the belt of truth. The belt that he's talking about was not just a belt like what we wear to hold up a pair of pants. It was a belt that had long leather, very thick leather pieces hanging from it. You know, that skirt-like thing that they wear, which was, they were overlapped so that no arrow could penetrate it. So it protected him from the waist almost to the knees. So let's focus on the, focus on the truth part, which is, I guess, key. Tell me, somebody, engage on what the belt of truth would then relate to. Bring the word truth into the conversation. My commentary, one of the things it says in here is for the, the belt of truth. Uh, because Satan is the father of lies, in John 8, 44, he cannot stand against the truth. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the truth in John 14. And victory is spiritual warfare with the fruit. Okay, let's be practical in 21st century now. What is your belt 
of truth. In your quest for holiness, what is your belt of truth? I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but has anyone compromised the truth recently? Don't answer. At some level, you could have said something and you... Because sometimes not speaking up is an untruth. When you should have spoken up and you didn't speak up, that's compromising the truth. It doesn't have to be an explicit, bold-faced lie. It could be, I shaded this thing or I kept silent. And that may be asking yourself on the integrity question. Did I show myself to be a man or woman of integrity? Or did I compromise in the interest of peacekeeping? Or just saving face? I just, somebody asked me a question and I didn't want to tell the whole truth, so I told a half truth. It happens. Because either you're sparing somebody's feelings or you're saving yourself embarrassment. So what does it take to be people of integrity? Do you say the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help me God, yes. I was just going to say, sometimes it's like you're, you're so taken aback by what somebody has said. This happens to me quite a bit. And you're not even sure what to say. <laughs> and so rather than allow the maybe not as loving parts of me to respond, it's better to be quiet than to inadvertently injure somebody because you're so taken aback by what they've just said. And I don't know if that's a lack of integrity or not. What I know is that sometimes it's better to be quiet than to speak too quickly and inadvertently do damage to somebody else. How about this side of the room? Any comment? I think the, I think the greater temptation, not the greater, a great temptation is to say truth is relative. That's what I was trying to. And what may be true in this situation and may not be true in another situation where I'm required to give a different answer or live a, act or live a different way. And so the truth changes depending on what the situation is or who is, who is putting the question or the issue to me. Um, instead of realizing or understanding, I think, I think it's true that God's truths are not relative, but are object, objective, if that's the right Absolute. word. Absolute. Absolute. You know, God's truth is true, and God will always be God. I must confess that I do struggle with the same issue, because in different situations, something might not apply. And therefore you ask, well, do I use my yardstick to measure this? Yeah, right. It, sometimes it is not that easy, but the belt of truth requires that you as a Christian take a stand and say, well, here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to either pledge integrity and walk out that thing, or I'm not going to pledge it because I'm not sure I can walk it out. But he did say that you need to be girded with the belt of truth around and your waist. And to be with a loyal loyalty. Some people try to be loyal to a human being instead of God. Mm -hmm. So they can't tell the truth because they're loyal to one person. Mm -hmm. I, I, when we're talking about truth, and I think the sword is, I guess, an offensive thing. Mm -hmm. And we're talking truth as a defensive. But I think it could be also one of the few other ones that is an offensive measure. It's like, I'm telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. Here's the word of God right here. So it doesn't have to be necessarily, this one is an interesting. It is. Because if you're evangelizing, you have to come to someone and tell them Jesus is the truth. Yeah. You can't be waiting for them to attack you or say something they to say this is true. You have to come to them with truth. So like I, I've gotten very uncomfortable with how comfortable the evangelical church is with liars and liars. And how that's kind of like, oh, let's just smooth all that over. It's okay to lie now. And so when you have a lot of lying going on, and people who say they're aligned with Christ, co-signing the lying, that makes me feel exceedingly uncomfortable. I'll go in a slightly different direction to say that because of grace, people think it's okay to lie and then ask forgiveness. So there are many, I don't want to say pastors necessarily, but lots of people who fall into moral cases. 
And then they say to their congregation, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah. And please, and they continue the next Sunday. Because they ask, they repented before their congregation or before some group of pastors, and they continue. They don't give up the ministry, they continue. Yeah. So there are many situations, but it's too complex and too complicated for me to get into all today, because the world has certainly changed the standards. Right now, there is this fight in the Baptist Church, Southern Baptist Convention, a lady called Beth Moore, who is not allowed to speak to men or to preach in the Baptist Church, but she preaches elsewhere. She's a Southern Baptist, and the Southern Baptists don't allow women to preach. She can preach elsewhere, but she can't preach in the Baptist, in the Southern Baptist Convention. Not on a lot of yes, they are. <laughs> and so they're, because they're saying, well, the Bible clearly says that a woman ought not to teach. And I said last week, you know, William Booth said some of my best men are women. So if they're saying the Bible says if you want to stick to biblical inerrancy, then a woman is not supposed to teach in a group of men. Therefore, she can't teach because she can teach. Where does it say that? Huh? Where does it say that? And Timothy, in, in the letter to Timothy, I'll, I'll give it to you after. The point I was making is a smaller point, though, that there's some people who say this is what Scripture says, and therefore this is true. And as a result, if you compromise this, you're not walking in truth. And they create an unnecessary fight. But you also have Paul going down to the river to a group of women mm -hmm. who were gathered together teaching each other. I'm going to make a little bit more progress. I have seven minutes. Sorry, three minutes. <laughs> so we can go through the armor, the breastplate of righteousness. The, bre the breastplate protects the vital organs. And I think the breastplate of righteousness is really focused on the righteousness. What does it mean to be righteous? As you walk out righteousness in your own life, what are you committing to? Walking at a higher level of integrity. Also being obedient to the scriptures following God's law, living a life of righteousness, a standard of righteousness. Having your feet shod with the sandals or shoes of peace. Having a shield of faith, which extinguishes the flaming arrows of the enemy. Having a helmet of salvation. Again, all these are defensive items. And then I come to the sword of of the spirit, which is the word of God. I like how S in front of word becomes sword. The only attack weapon in the arsenal. And the swords that they carry were very sharp on both edges at the point, And you could do a lot of damage with that particular weapon. So I'm going to summarize at this point to say that as Paul closes this letter, he tells them, make sure that you understand that this fight is a spiritual fight. And do your best to keep it in that context. I think we're out of time, so I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson. May we be surrounded by our belt of truth, and may we be prepared to carry the weapons of warfare to the enemy. Help us to understand that this is a spiritual battle, and that the enemy will be seeking to trip us up, that you will be our constant guard and protector. So may we continue to trust you, and believe that you will protect us and guide our steps. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.